Um, just to kind of ground us ourselves a little bit here, I'd just like to share this quote from Leah Penniman. Um, Leah is the uh, author of Farming While Black, and this is from a piece she, um, she wrote called Black Gold, which is in a book called All That We Can Save. It's women writers writing about the climate crisis. Part of the work of healing a relationship with soil is unearthing and relearning the lessons of soil reverence from the past. The soil stewards of the past recognize that healthy soil is not only imperative for our food and climate security, but also foundational for our cultural and emotional well being. And I share that because it, it combines the kind of the science around um, food production that we're going to be talking about, but it also shares, um, it also speaks to the cultural. Um, aspect of this. I think that we're getting to the point in the food system work and in the climate work where we understand what needs to be done, but we have to change our, our kind of cultural will to make it happen. So I think Leah does a nice job of touching on both of those there. So this track, Farming and Fishing, Abundance, Equity, and Resiliency, uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk about food production in Maine and as in response to unstable climate, resource depletion, and this brittleness of the global, global food supply that produces 90% of the food for Maine, basically, which if we think about Maine's food system, it's really not the system, it's not the food that's produced in Maine so much. Our food system is mostly exported food, or I'm sorry, imported food. So if we want to make a sustainable food system for Maine and have food security, it's going to mean ramping up local production. And this track is really about how we break through the barriers to increasing local production, um, making food and farming more accessible to lots more people. Um, and you'll see in our, our systems map later how we've kind of broken it down. But um, so we're focused primarily on that aspect. We're talking about uh, increasing local production um, while also regenerating our agricultural landscape and our water and our soil. So that's kind of the focus of this particular group. And like I said, we'll be working together for the next three weeks on this. Um, Besides myself and Heather, I just want to shout out to Sandy Gilbreth, who's doing the tech work for us today, and for Annie Doran, who's our coordinator for the entire project and is also um, um, helping facilitate and coordinate this, this particular track. And you'll be hearing from both of them as we, as we go forward. So I don't want to go too far into this now because Hopefully many of you have been in our, um, we're at the opening session and have been looking at our website. Um, but the mission of this project is, like I mentioned, is really about developing deeper relationships and greater trust among all these food system actors, food system players, um, to, to get where we need to go to co-create an equitable and thriving food system for Maine is gonna really rely on building these relationships. And we're hoping that we've created this convergence. We, we totally intended to do this in person, to break bread together, to have meals together, to be able to look each other in the eye, to shake hands, to hug, to cry together, to do all those things you do when you're in person. Um, unfortunately, you know, as, as everybody has had to do, we've had to shift to this virtual world, which has given us an opportunity to be more inclusive. People can show up, people that don't have the ability to travel um, to in-person events, but it is what it is. And we're gonna do our best to work within this format to be as inclusive and um, dynamic as possible to hear as many voices as we can. So. Yeah, I just wanna make a, a note, just technical to include so people can see each other a little bit more too. Just technical note, there's a sidebar between the slides and all the pictures of you all. And if you want to move that sidebar over to the left to make the um, slide smaller, then you can see more of each other. Um, I'm enjoying doing that. So I just want to pass that on. 
Yeah, and if you can keep your camera on too, it, it really helps us all to see who's in the room and because um, it's important that we think of ourselves as a community here as we move this forward. So, you know, as I've alluded to, the goals of this convergence are to develop and strengthen those trusting relationships. And we've already seen this happening just in prepping and working and building this convergence together. There's been 10 or 11 of us that have been really going at this hard for the last couple of months and you know, a group long before that. And those, a lot of relationships are already being built. Um, and our goal here is, is to catalyze collective action. And we don't know what the actions are gonna be. It's about the people that are in, that are showing up, and we're gonna decide in this group our priorities for which collective actions we're gonna to take together. But that's our, our goal. One of the, the primary goals of the convergence is to build those relationships to move towards collective action. Secondly, we're trying to, I, and then this will be more in towards the end here, to develop structures where we can find out who the key stakeholders are, what those priorities are, and then building that transparency among, among each other, among our organizations, among funders, and we're seeing this happening already to really start to, to make a commitment to each other, to work together to solve some of these, you know, really deep, wicked problems that we face in our food system. We were gonna do a poll, which is probably why Annie was waving around. Um, so we wanted to just get a sense, we're gonna do a couple polls actually. We wanted to get a sense of who's, who's in the room with us today. So if people just take, take a minute, this is a super easy um, run through and just, Fill out this poll and we're, we'll share it and we'll get a better sense of, of who we all are here today. This is so interesting to see. Okay, I guess we could do, should we end it there? It seems like we're kind of winding down. Share the results. So it looks like about three quarters of us were at the opening session. So hopefully um, we won't be too redundant with, with what in this opening here. Um, for those that, that didn't, I think those um, recordings are gonna be available on the website. And um, I, I really recommend, there's some, there some great presentations there that be worth going back and checking out. It looks like um, most of the people in this room grow food, either for production, um, which we were, we're just, I just gotta say, we're really happy to see that almost 40% of us grow food for production. That was a big goal to try to get producers here to really talk about these issues. So thank you guys for showing up. I know it's already getting towards seed starting time. Um, and we tried to do this as early as we could to catch um, our producers when they weren't as busy. Um, and um, it looks like we're about split equally between people that um, quote unquote own land and um, people that don't. So just a, a better sense of who's in the room. Awesome. Uh, how are we doing here? I'd like to. Um, I'd like to ask one more question in another another quick poll. Um, can we bring up that? Just kind of curious if people know which tribal lands that um, you occupy where you live. And we can we can move on to share that map. Sandy. Well, that's amazing that we see so many of us are aware. Maybe if people did attend the opening session that um, 
that, that awareness. Cool. Well, it's, it's, I think if we had done this poll two years ago, it might have been kind of the opposite. So perhaps we're, um, we're really making progress here to acknowledge the land that we're on, which I, is something that I'd like to do right now. I do want to not see that. So I'd just like to acknowledge that we farm, garden, fish, and work on the unceded territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. Wabanaki peoples have stewarded this land we now call Maine for thousands of years and did a good job on it. And they continue to steward this land today. This project, the Maine Food Convergence, stands in solidarity with Wabanaki land, food, water, and cultural sovereignty. Acknowledging the land theft and violence of colonization is a small step on a long journey that we're committed to. A journey of truth telling, atonement, and repair that will guide us towards a regenerative and equitable food system here in this place we now call Maine. So I'd just like to take let us all take a breath and a brief moment of silence to honor that, um, that debt to the Wabanaki Confederacy. So thanks for that. Um, and I'd just like to mention that in your packet that you got, there was a Food system, racial equity in the food system resource guide. That's a, that's there, and I think um, Annie's putting it in the chat again right now. Some great resources there. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Heather, who's going to kind of talk a little bit about our theory of change and 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 where we're headed here today. Take Everyone, away, Heather. hi. Thank you, Scott. And thank you all for being here today. My name is Heather Augustine. I'm a Wabanaki woman from the Elsa Booktuk First Nation in New Brunswick, Canada. I live in Maine, in Brunswick, Maine, and have really lived in Maine for most of my life. So I am going to introduce you to our theory of change. This is the overarching framework for this track. So if you aren't familiar with this model, don't worry about it because as our session continues, we will adjust this theory of change based on input gathered from all of you. We will also be identifying top priorities and then working to develop these priorities, which we will fill out the vision, activities, resource needs, and all the details in between. So we will keep reflecting on this map in the version of the logic model to you, so don't you don't have to worry about that now. Okay, so um, next I'm excited to introduce you to Jesse Watson and Kessie Kimball. They're going to have a little panel discussion for us all to enjoy. Jesse Watson is the founder of the Midcoast Permaculture Design. He was a teacher with the Resilience Hub Permaculture Design course in the board president of the Permaculture Associ Association of the Northeast, known as PAN, for many years. Kessie is a Mi'kmaq woman and one of my favorite humans in the whole world, graduate of the Native American Studies Department at USM, and she is a member of the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective and a very successful food producer. If you have any questions throughout the panel for either or both of them, please put your question in the chat and we'll try to answer them after they have a chance to share with us um, what they're all about and their projects. Thank you. Is this where we pin Jesse and Kessie to the top of the screen can we do that or should i do that there we go let's do um jesse first is that okay with you guys okay pretty sure she said that okay awesome okay jesse take it away let's hear it 
Okay. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay? Am I doing this right? So far. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I'm sorry, I just have a thing. Okay. Am I unmuted still? Sorry. Yep. We can hear you. Okay, cool. Here we go. All right. So I, I just, I did prepare some statements for, for this uh, brief introduction to some um, heady and potentially heavy topics as well. So I'll just introduce myself first. I'm, I'm Jesse Watson. I operate Midcoast Permaculture Design. Uh, I've been doing landscape design, farm planning, and construction contracting work for residential and farm clients since 2009. Uh, I've taught permaculture design certificate programs in partnership with the Resilience Hub and MOFCA, the main Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, since 2012. Uh, I have served on the board of the Permaculture Association of the Northeast. That was, you know, a few years back, um, 2014 to 2018. And I hold a diploma of site design from the Permaculture Institute of North America. Um, I was instrumental in passing a food sovereignty ordinance in my um, town of Rockland in 2018. And I, I still live in Rockland. Uh, on a rewilding one acre demonstration site that incorporates small scale agroforestry, annual and perennial polycultures, small livestock, and occasionally nursery production. Um, I have a lineage of um, study. I don't know if anybody cares, but it does involve permaculture design, holistic management, tea line design, uh, master gardener certificate, construction trades primitive skills and community organizing and it's nice to see some old friends uh, in the in the room here uh, that I haven't seen for for a long time from from old organizing days so um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about permaculture and then how I see it connecting with this uh, big topic of decolonization so Permaculture is a philosophy of landscape design and land management that is inspired by the system science of agroecology and a philosophy of deep nature connection and weaving patterns of mutual benefit between elements in ecosystems. As a philosophy, we remember that we are a keystone species, part of the ecosystem instead of some lord taking dominion over natural resources. Um, it is within this philosophical perspective that we are able to remember that all of us yearn, I think, to reconnect to our innate indigenous soul, to paraphrase Martine Pretel. Um, many solutions surrounding climate adaptation and mitigation involve planting trees. Um, at a large scale, we can move away from lawn, grain, and commodity agriculture and move toward tree crop horticulture and diversified agroforestry. And it turns out that this is how most humans procured their food before the invention of grain-based agriculture. So there is something deeply intuitive and ancestral about cultivating ecosystems for perennial food production hunting and foraging. There's evidence of uh, forest garden ecosystem stewardship throughout Amazonia, as well as pre-agricultural Eurasia, where whole ecosystems were stewarded toward food production and habitat enhancement. A change in land management in, in the direction of a rewilded agroforestry uh, can have a similar rewilding effect on the culture of those land managers, both individually and collectively. I've seen it in myself anyways. Um, and it's through this deep connection to land, through the management practices associated with permaculture, that a degree of decolonization can happen in your mind. So there's something paradoxical about permaculture because it, it is a product of uh, the colonial mind, but in some paradoxical way through this um, weaving of mutually beneficial relationships in ecosystems, paradoxically, it, 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 I think it helps to weed the empire out of your mind. So 
decolonization in a literal sense is about upholding uh, longstanding treaties, adherence to international law, and the return of genuine sovereignty and the administration of unceded land to First Nations peoples. Decolonization is about correcting past crimes committed by mostly European settlers by returning stolen land. Uh, if we genuinely care about the regeneration of ecosystems and culture, we should talk more openly about this tension of owning stolen land, especially when seeking relationships with contemporary Native peoples. Um, in another sense, a cultural sense, uh, decolonization is about the process of removing colonizing thoughts from our own mind and colonizing behavior from our own life way. In this sense, there's broad overlap between movements for social justice and anti-racism. So this critique that I offer of permaculture and land ownership is, is offered to make the evolution of our movement cleaner and more respectful of indigenous cultures. I submit that the framework of decolonization would also save permaculture from being one more happy-faced, greenwashed, eco-groovy front for the project of genocide. Um, we have to be careful in the space of regenerative agriculture, permaculture, rewilding, primitive skills, etc., that we don't accidentally play out some settler replacement fantasy. It seems like we're doing important work with permaculture and regenerative sustainable agriculture and so on. And I think it's worth separating the baby from the bathwater. So I, I see an agenda of decolonization coupled with land use based on permaculture design as a positive way forward toward a time of greater ecological and social health in which we rediscover how to live in right relationship to a place while simultaneously repairing and healing historic crimes against humanity. Um, part of my work involves demystifying the permaculture design process and make it as democratically accessible as possible so that you all can practice some kind of self, self provisioning in your own spaces and hopefully become uh, resources for your neighbors, friends, and family, especially because climate change stands as an existential threat to industrial civilization. And during times of crisis, people are much more open to new ideas lying around. And my goal is to keep the ideas of permaculture and, re and rewilding alive, relevant, anti-statist, and anti-racist. So speaking in bumper sticker wisdom for a second, we're all in this together and an injury to one is an injury to all. So I think we would be wise to remember principles of solidarity and apply some thinking tools of intersectionality to the work of solidarity. Um, so those are, my, those are my prepared statements and I, it was a tight time frame. so. I'm Thank fine. you, Jesse. Thank you so, so much. Okay, Cassie, we're ready to hear from oh, you. I should have gone first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Kesty Waters Kimball. Um, I organize with Eastern Woodlands Rematriation Collective. I am Micmac. I produce food um, on the one acre plot at Maui Yama Garden in Mount Vernon, Maine. And I lease that land. I don't own it. Um, with Eastern Woodlands, we are a collective of uh, food and medicine producers, fisher folk, hunters, foragers. Um, we do embrace the people's agroecology process and um, as a way of building international solidarity with um, fellow peasant farmers and landless farmers. Um, part of the work that we're doing with our food distribution and uh, production is rebuilding our reciprocity networks and sharing our abundance um, freely within our network. It's not about um, creating products for sale or for commodity. It's about um, having abundance to share within our um, families and with our greater tribal communities. And then we've also been rebuilding intertribal alliances across um, what is now known as New England. So we've built um, an incredible network of women and two-spirit folks that have been doing the heavy lifting to feed and provide medicine to their communities throughout um, this crisis. And uh, yeah, I've only been really farming on the one acre for, for a year now, so I'm, by means, um, not an expert or anything like that. But, um, what I did want to acknowledge is that um, 
in Jesse's talk about just acknowledging um, decolonizing principles and acknowledging that permaculture is um, and rewilding and a lot of this stuff is ultimately intellectual property theft and um, has never been acknowledged as such, but it, it truly is. And um, acknowledging that is the first step forward. Um, what else do we want to say? Um, the other thing about decolonizing is that I just hear it used so much now that it seems to have a lot of, um, it's just become a trope, like along with words like regenerative and um, restorative agriculture, they, they become tropes and it loses the actual um, teeth of like what, what we're trying to do by decolonizing and by changing minds and working together. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that we are in a state today where we are sharing land, where it's not going to go back into time. We can't um, go back to prehistoric times and have things be as they were. So we, we are where we are. And I feel it's important that we find ways to work together because we are on the same boat. And yeah. And I'd just like to open up and be more conversational. I have a lot more points I can add to, but I'd like to hear. Thank you so much, Kessie. Are there any questions people have that they'd like to put into the chat? I can't really see any, I don't know why. Um, but um, Jesse, is there anything that you would like to add to um, go off of what Kessie said while we kind of wait for some questions? Talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Kessie. And, um, Look, I'm 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 honored to even be here in in the first place. I mean, thank thanks to Scott and the organizers for for this um, event to to be able to host these kinds of conversations. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think Kessie uh, made a good point with um, the idea that a lot of this stuff is intellectual property theft, which. I guess the concept of intellectual property, I have mixed feelings about, a eh? Because, um, you know, now we're going to make ideas and concepts and sentences and phrases and turns of speech in, into, into a commodity to sell. There's a lot of, you know, and I feel a lot of um, uh, attention with the, with, the, with the concept of intellectual property. And, and, and yet your, your point is, uh, well made and and sound, I think. A friend of mine, um, you know, Bill Mollison. He's the you know one of the founders of permaculture and stuff. And 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 this guy, um, he was as much an anthropologist as he was uh, an ecologist. And um, and he did spend a lot of his time studying a lot of Aboriginal peoples in Australia and throughout Southeast Asia before moving on to Africa and Latin America and stuff. Um, and I guess part of, from what I'm, from what I understand, okay, now there's, there's lots of stories to the permaculture movement and stuff. And, and one of the stories, and I think he talks about it in his autobiography, which is out of print now, but he talked about this, he could see the march of empire and globalization spreading across the entire planet and, and the industrial machine just sort of eating all land-based cultures and he wanted he wanted to put together a toolkit so that because he he could see that there was a limited lifespan on on industrial empire and industrial civilization and he wanted to put together a toolkit for land-based cultures to reconstitute themselves after the retreat of empire um so i i guess that's I mean, dis despite these 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 critiques and these and these and these criticisms, um, you know, I'm just curious. Like, what does it what does it mean to separate the ba the baby from the bathwater? You know. Thank you for that, Jesse. I just have when Scott and I were putting this panel together, and we've just been like talking about um, what it means to bring you and Kessie together into the same space, and maybe you would be best to answer this, Kessie. I you know, we're, we're thinking of it, this convergence as an opportunity to bridge communities that may have 
um, had friction in the past. And, and I know that Scott has identified that the permaculture has identified that they have acknowledged that there has maybe been some harm there. And so do you see like opportunities like the convergence as places where bridges can be built between communities where there has been harm and, and opportunities can come from this as a way of um, having reparations and maybe future projects together for like, you know, the benefit of the land? Yeah, I mean, that's really why I'm here um, because I do feel that we can be um, better allies. We can be accomplices. We can help each other to, um, to change the food system in a radical way that actually um, is feeding people healthy food that we are sustainable as a, a region producing our own food and not relying on these um, huge supply chain networks that are truly unsustainable. And um, somebody wanted me to talk about like the decolonization. So it's, it's a lot over there. Um, <laughs> but, but Whatever no, you want to talk about, we want to hear. So just go for it. But I just, the, the things that I worry about is when people start talking decolonization and regenerative, restorative, polyculture, permaculture, they become like just these words that are, that become like talking points that get regurgitated so much that the true meaning becomes lost and it just becomes a metaphor for, for this change that we want to see. And some people embrace these terms and say that they're doing these things like I stand in solidarity with you. And it's just a move to try to relieve um, settler guilt or whatever. We don't need you to stand in solidarity. We need you to take action in mm -hmm. solidarity. And, um, and I feel like this is a place that we can do that. I feel, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work, Heather and I have been doing a lot of work just distributing food outside of the regular food pantries and this and that, because there's so many people that are just fall through the cracks. There needs to be change. I mean, it shouldn't be just random aunties and mamas running around um, having to cart food, you know, all over the place to feed people, but that's the reality that we, we are in. You know, there's a lot of hunger. There's, I mean, the statistics, I don't think really even actually cover, you know, I grew up hungry and I'm still seeing hunger around me. So nothing's really changed. I grew up on government cheese, you know, it's still here, you know, nothing's changed. So we've, we've got to change the way that our, our, you know, industry is and all of that. And I, I, I don't have all the answers. Um, like I said, I'm just one person out here trying to make a difference. And I do feel like I have some allies out here, but I would encourage you to be more radical in your action and, um, and using your positions of power to be true accomplices and to blow up the system and rebuild it. Oh my gosh, that was like a perfect way to end a very um, thoughtful discussion between Jesse and Kessie. Thank you both so much for being here. I know that you'll be in the, the rest of this um, session one today. And I, um, I have so many more questions. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, we are out. I'm trying to stick to time, which is not like yeah. something. Really We're like running out of time. Sorry, we won't get to all your questions, but I did copy them so we won't lose them at least. And maybe we can address them another way somehow. Yeah. I just want to add, I can I just add one thing very briefly is that um, I, I love what you said, Cassie, about standing in solidarity. I want to stand in solidarity in the garden. Heather and I have been talking about a lot. It's a lot, Olivia and I, Moore and I talked about it this morning. Like, let's grow gardens together. There's so much knowledge and skill sets in the permaculture world that is just crying to get out and be put to use um, to help restore some of this um, Wabanaki land back to its former glory and um, then increase that access. So um, let's get in the garden together. You're welcome to come join me. <laughs> So where are we here? It's moving forward. Thank you so much, both of you. That was great and hopefully the beginning of a lot of um, work together. So um, we're gonna get back to the, um, to the track here. Sandy, can you throw up that, um, the format of the sessions slide just to give people a little bit of a sense of where this is going and um, what, where we're up to today. So, so we've got three sessions, as you all know, and, and, and 
probably have looked into it some, but today we're going to try to move through and identify. We've, we've through our um, regional dialogues, through our statewide survey, through our stakeholder meeting, we've come up with priorities for each of our track areas. Um, we've developed eight that Heather's going to go over for this track area. And they're, they're, they could be eight different ones, but we're trying to just cover all the issues around um, food production and what's prevent, preventing us there. And then so once today we're going to go into breakouts, we're going to all discuss these different um, sessions or these different issues. And then we're going to come back and like pitch them back to the group, like the ones that you're passionate about, take a minute to pitch them back. And, um, and then next week we're going to, we're going to go deep into developing um, around those, around those priorities that we, that come out of this. And then in the final week, we're going to try to really organize for action, you know, maybe it's new coalitions, maybe it's a new initiative, maybe it's another policy, a policy piece, or we're gonna be learning about policy that's related to things that there's people in the tracks here that are gonna be able to come back and present on tons of, there's so much food policy happening in the state now. So we're gonna come out of this hopefully after session three with some, with some clear action plans. And then in our final um, reconvening, we're gonna come back together and be able to pitch these actions to the larger group and try to um, come out of this moving forward with some with some solid projects. Um, before we get too far down the road into our breakout sessions, um, I just want to remind everybody, I know a lot of people were here for the um, for the opening session where Amara Afiji went through these agreements that um, her and a, another group of people at the Maine Environmental Educators Association have developed this, these agreements for their work. And there's a lot here, but I just wanna pull a few nuggets out. So first of all, just to try to really be present in the work. I know it's really hard when you're on screens and there's other screens around to sort of stay, stay grounded, but um, if we can begin by just kind of grounding ourselves. So I'm gonna um, ask everybody to do what Steph Cesario asked the other night, just, Right now, just take the deepest breath that you've taken all day. Exhale and reground yourself, so. All right, so here we are. Um, we'd also just like to point out, if you're a person that's often up front, sharing a lot, um, has a lot to say, maybe this is a good time to like move up to active listening. Really take a, take a chance to listen to those other voices because you'd be surprised how much you can learn. And if you're a person that typically hangs back, um, you know, maybe today's the day you step up and, and uh, get out of your comfort zone and share some of those ideas that, that we so desperately need to hear. Um, and recognize that as we're sharing these ideas, there are multiple truths in the room and that nobody's right and nobody's wrong, but we have to be able to share these ideas and process them together. Um, and on that note, we're, work to remove the, those power imbalances in the, in the room, in our group, among this work, and the, the, just embrace the excitement of seeing new leadership emerge. I work in the climate movement, and I have seen a whole new group of leaders step up into that movement, and it's, it's, it changes everything. Um, we're, all, we're, all, um, we're all in this together. Um, and, and in terms of how we measure our success here. Um, again, this project is, is sort of founded on not having definable goals um, that we're working towards other than this notion of building relationships, building this fertile ground for all of these positive um, outcomes to emerge. So creating authentic relationships is key to this work and that's a lot of what we're gonna focus on. Um, and building these relationships to, to catalyze around um, common goals in the end, so. And you might have already gathered this, but some of the conversations that we are having and we and may ha have, especially in the breakout sessions, might trigger emotions, strong emotions in, in people. Um, these are, you know, can be some hard conversations to have, letting go of our preconceived ideas, letting go of things we've, you know, or, or just hearing things that we've never really thought about before could, could bring up some stuff that, but we'd rather not try to process that in the breakout rooms. So if people have 
some issues they want to they want to work on they, they need to talk to somebody about we have this email address set up um, you can see it there mfcp council at gmail.com and there's a um, there's a couple people on the other side of that that are willing to to help people with those conversations and there's both white and bipoc people available to talk to help with that So I'm going to turn it back over to Heather, and she's going to introduce our storytelling session today. Okay, thanks, Scott. So part of this convergence will be weaving some storytelling into each session. Um, I always love a good story, so I'm looking forward to hearing all the stories throughout each session and hear about the stories that took place in other tracks. Today's storyteller is um, Lily Nigren. She is a, um, I guess you'd call it a clam harvester, clam digger, I don't know. Um, anyways, so we're going to share her story next, and um, please enjoy. Thank you. I think we're having just a little tech situation. Uh, who is sharing that video? Do we know? So she's working on it. Oh, okay, great. Just a minute. Yeah, no problem. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to be joining you today. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person virtually, um, but I You guys can't see the video? No. We can see the, the screen. We were hoping to have Hello. Here with us live today, but um, she had another commitment, so recorded this, and we weren't ready to make that change. If we were all together live, we could just say talk amongst yourselves, but that's not really an issue of possibility here. Do you want me to try to share my screen with us, Andy? Or are you getting it? Yeah. Yes, to share my screen? Yes, if you can, yeah. All right, let me see if I can do it. I don't know if it'll work, but. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be joining you today. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person virtually, um, but I'm still so grateful for the opportunity to share my story with all of you. Is that working? My name is Lily Nigren, and I'm a commercial shellfish harvester, also known as a clam digger. I dig and sell clams commercially in my home. Oops, hold on. I just put it to full screen and it stopped. Hold on. I'm very lucky enough to be working alongside my two older brothers who are also clamors and were the reason that I decided to get into, the, into this industry in the first place. So I first became involved in the fishing and working waterfront industries um, by watching my older brothers get ready to go out digging or fishing with their boots and bushel baskets. And I always found it very fascinating that they could work for themselves, be outside while on the job, and 
The way that my town distributes commercial shellfish licenses is through a lottery system. Um, both my brothers were lucky enough to be chosen one year for the available licenses. So the following year, that was kind of my first introduction to the working waterfront industry. Before that, I had no experience. Our family had no experience before my brothers. Um, we just kind of jumped in and um, found our way as we went, which was very exciting and rewarding, I would say. So when thinking about my identity and lived experiences, um, being one of the only female harvesters in my town is something that I always acknowledge on my journey. Having two older brothers going to work with me, I felt safe knowing that they were looking out for me. Um, but I do know that some women in this industry don't have the same experiences as me. The feeling that I got of security allowed me to be very confident and present in my job. So not worrying about my safety or what others out on the water would say to me as I was working. Being a woman, many of the older men didn't take me seriously at first because I didn't look like a stereotypical Maine fisherman. It took some time to earn their respect. However, I do feel that they acknowledge me for who I am and for the, the success that I have found in this industry. Another important thing to note is that in my hometown of Scarborough, the working waterfront industry is entirely white dominated. There is no diversity and it isn't representative of the many perspectives, lived experiences, and cultural differences of the people living and working in Maine. So throughout my six years I've been clamming, I've seen some real threats to the longevity of the industry due to climate changes. So the clam populations in my town, as well as many neighboring towns in Southern Maine have had declining populations pretty consistently. So lower populations mean fewer clams and at the end of the day, a smaller paycheck to bring home. The majority of clamors in my town are older, with over half of them being eligible for social security, and many solely depending on clamming to provide for their families. So the decline in clams has sparked many conversations about conservation efforts and ways to revamp the clam flats um, in multiple ways. Conservation projects in Scarborough are required for all clamors, and in recent years, they have been focusing on removing invasive green crabs and milky ribbon worms, which kill clams and are pretty notorious for creating dead zones out on the flats. I have been involved in the Casco Bay Regional Shellfish Working Group, which brings together many different Southern Maine shellfish harvesters from multiple towns, um, multiple specific industries, including clamming. Um, and it provides a space to exchange conservation strategies, talk about common issues, and work on solutions to those problems. So having the opportunity to exchange ideas with people from outside of our towns is really great to hear new perspectives and get ideas for updating ordinances and procedures. Um, something that in Scarborough we've been doing a lot is um, some surveying. So seeing areas where um, there are there's a lot of clam seed um, called spat. So places with a lot of spat will eventually um, have grown up clams that are really great for digging. Um, and so talking a lot about um, kind of the future generations of clams has been something at um, these working group meetings that has kind of been um, the center of attention, I would say. Um, so, but when thinking about the future of the working waterfront industry and specifically commercial clamming, um, I see an opportunity to utilize climate research as a roadmap and guidebook for moving forward. I think acknowledging that changes are happening and finding a way to make our industry resilient, um, but also able to react to these changes will be important. Uh, my academic interests have definitely been influenced by my commercial clamming experiences. Um, so in college, I have been participating in um, and have in the past participated in other ones, but currently I'm focusing on marine climate changes 
and how intertidal communities, such as salt marshes, um, are affected by different factors, such as temperature of the water, salinity, pH, um, a lot of different um, factors that have been pretty popular in literature. And um, so seeing continued conservation efforts is definitely going to be a critical step in maintaining clam populations um, and our industry as a whole, but also exploring new ideas such as seeding and transplant projects um, will help to ramp up healthy new generations of clams um, in a time where many are dying off. I think that many people will be important to um, work together and seeing this goal become a reality. Um, you know, being able to adapt and collaborate will be crit critical in its success. Um, I'm hopeful for the future of the working waterfront industry as a whole, and I'm grateful for all of the experiences I've gained from it. Many lessons, of course. Um, hopefully you enjoy just a quick, um, short overview of my personal story on this um, journey and kind of the fishing industry. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your meeting converging um, today. And good luck in your breakout groups. Have a great day. Okay, back to you, Sandy, with your screen share. Whoops. <laughs> you can see my emails. Oh wait, I have to stop screen share. Okay. That was great. Um, I really enjoyed that. I hope you all enjoyed that too. So we're gonna take a couple, a little bit of time here and um, go into breakout groups. And I have a prompt for you all in your breakout rooms. Um, so how has your identity and experience informed the work that you do and how you do it? So you should be receiving a invitation to join a breakout group here and um, just enjoy your time together. Well, welcome back everybody. Um, hope you had a chance to take a quick break. We had thought we'd have a little bit longer time for people to get out and stretch and breathe, but um, here we are. Before we get into our priorities, I just wanted to um, encourage people to check out the network map that's being built by all of the participants. Um, I think Sandy's gonna put up a slide to talk about that. Um, yeah, so there it is. So I hope people have had a chance to, to get um, to get on the map, as it were. And um, in, because we can't all be together in, in, a, in a room doing this and look across the room and see who's there, um, this is kind of a cool way to, to kind of see who's in the virtual room and who's in the convergence um, in general. And I just, I, we don't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but um, encourage everybody to go and just noodle around. You can click on individual people, you can click on organizations and see who they are, a little bit about them. And then this map, maps connection, which is what our convergence is about. And um, th this is just a static picture, but if you look up into, um, on the top, you have a, a place you can click on there about interest areas. And I, for this screenshot, I just clicked on sustainable ecosystems and vibrant farms and fisheries which is kind of what this, the, the interest areas that, uh, around this track. So you can see, then it breaks it down. So guessing that most of the people you see in organizations on this map are focused on those things. So, so just, you know, make sure you get on the map and, and you know, enjoy spending some time um, seeing who's, who's in this with you. And with just that, another quick note on that, Scott, sorry, is it, it's also gonna help us identify who's not in the room. So that's an important piece, you know, go to the map, who needs to be in these conversations, who's not on there, and please invite them or pass them on to us. Good point, Annie. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Heather to um, talk about the priorities that we developed over the regional dialogues. 
and then a look a little bit at the systems map, and then we're going to go and have some conversations and start figuring out what we want to focus on. So it's Oh, Heather. Okay. Um, can we get the priorities slide up? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. So um, these are our track B potential priorities. These priorities arose from the five regional dialogues held in Augusta plus a statewide survey. And that's actually how I learned about the convergence is I um, I don't know if it was on Facebook or what it was, and I filled out a survey, and that's how I found out. So it's interesting. Those surveys are really helpful. Um, we will be discussing these priorities in our breakout groups today, weighing in individually on which ones are top priority for collective action to develop into strategies during the convergence. And chances are these priorities will be combined into fewer groups. So next way we'll look at the systems map. Um, okay, are you all looking at that? I don't have the same slide. Okay, good. So this systems map was um, Peter Woodrow helped us to develop this map based on the priorities that we just looked at. And we will use this map as a way of seeing the intersection between current systems the red circle right in the middle is the goal of our track, okay? So the colored rectangles represent priorities from the former slide, and the circles represent the current conditions and issues affecting our part of the food systems. The arrows that connect the circles to one another will demonstrate the way all of these in, um, issues interconnect within the system. In the four corners where you see the R1, R2, R3, R4, represent the overarching topic areas. And just this is a tool to help us understand the system we are working in and to find places our work in this session can have the most effect on this system. And the systems map is in your packet. And as uh, we work together, this map will continue to evolve. So next we will um, have a chance to go into um, breakouts, uh, a breakout rooms for a priorities discussion. We will be in there for about an hour. Breakout rooms will be created by random assignment, six to eight people per room with one facilitator who is familiar with the jam boards and prompts for discussions. Discussion in the breakout rooms will be about priorities presented by the track teams and notes will be made in the Google Jamboard. This discussion is geared towards us all working together to shape our priorities. We will collect the information from the breakout groups as part of defining our priorities to work on within the next two sessions. And we'll share that before we start session two. So you'll have a chance to check that out. After the breakout discuss, uh, discussions, we encourage one person from each group to sort of make a case for any particular priority. So as we all get ready to join our breakout groups, I encourage you to have fun, build connections, and enjoy this time together. And I just want you to know I appreciate all of you being here, so thank you. You should see that invite come up here pretty soon. everybody. I assume this is everyone because we kind of got dumped pretty immediately in here. We didn't have to select anything. Um, my name is Julia uh, and I am one of the breakout room facilitators. Um, and I'm going to share a link with you all to um, this Jamboard. Um, which is, I'm going to also share my screen, but I just want everyone to have a link to it. Um, and the Jamboard is going to kind of like take us through um, the discussion prompts. Um, and I guess I'm curious, has anyone used Jamboard before? Um, 
yeah, it's a Google tool. Um, I, I, I was new to it too. So, and the reason I ask is because we, um, I, I can take the notes or someone else can take the notes, but if you're not familiar with it, then I'll, I will just do that. Um, and I was also curious if anyone um, would be willing to be our timekeeper. And I think the easiest way to do that is to use um, like a stopwatch feature on your phone if you have it. Um, that will just kind of help us help us do that. Molly, were you offering? Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, can folks see the see my screen here? The main food convergence slide. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, um, so, um, oh yeah. So we have, let's see, let me just check my notes to make sure we have everything. Oh yeah. We're in here for 60 minutes total and we'll get some notifications, but you'll notice there's, um, like a, a time um, at the bottom right hand corner of like how much time we should kind of spend in each area. Um, so, so, you know, as they explained earlier, we're identifying top priorities as part of this process. Um, and we're just going to start um, with introductions. Um, so just um, we're going to go around and ask um, people to share within one minute um, your name, affiliation, pronouns, and um, something about your connection to the land or sea of. So are we going to, Sandy, are you out there? Over there somewhere? I'm here. Are we all back to back from our breakouts at this point? Yes. Awesome. So I hope everybody had as interesting conversations as we did in our breakout room. Um, so this is the chance to, how, how are we going to set this up so people can? Um, what I, what we did yesterday is um, if somebody's championing a priority, I'm eating something wrong. <laughs> you can put your name in the chat. Scott will call on you and I'm going to try to time folks to really keep it down to 30 to 60 seconds so that as many people as possible can share. Um, and then if we have more time after people who champion their priorities, then we'll just call on folks from different groups to let us know um, some things that stuck with them. How's that? That sounds great. Um... Okay. Are we allowed to champion multiple priorities? Yeah, uh, we, we, may, we may be like melding things. So in, in our group, a lot of, there was a lot of melding going on, seeing the relationships between priorities and stuff. Um, Julia, do you want to start? Did you have something <laughs> since you asked? Um, I will, I will start. Um, so um, obviously a really wide spanning conversation um, and we definitely didn't necessarily highlight like what we thought were the top ones. So I'm just going to pick out ones that seem to resonate um, with me. So there's a question around like what um, seems to address like both um, the, um, it, there were uh, responses to what address both inequities and causes of climate disruption. Um, and so the case was made for, um, uh, you know, both, I'll say two and five, um, as being um, obviously will have impacts, like as we address climate change, um, will have an impact on um, inequities faced by, um, you know, frontline communities. Um, and that also, um, it was brought up that there's just a big, huge gap in sort of the technical assistance and the resources that um, farmers and fishermen and people who work the land like need in order to make climate um, adaptation changes. Um, so, um, and then there was related to that also something that will address both is number six, building the bridges because um, Western, someone said um, Western science has been advising farming for um, since World War II and um, it isn't working. And so um, building those bridges is um, going to uh, address both climate and inequities. Um, and then I'll also just say um, that we talked a lot about how number eight 
is maybe not as much a priority as it is something that needs to be woven as something that's really important right now as there's a lot of attention um, on the local food system um, to uh, really kind of harness the public interest um, and and um, work to shape wrap it up Julia <laughs> yeah work to shape the narrative um, into something that is actually change focused um, I'll stop Awesome. Thank you. Sounds like you had a great group. Um, I'm seeing that Chloe is um, a champion, and I don't know who Chloe even is. So, Chloe, if you want to unmute yourself and let it rip. And don't be shy. I'm Chloe. I am a champion. Um, so, my breakout room, also, another member of my breakout room. Is, is also gonna help me. So please feel free to join in to him. Um, so my breakout room kind of came to the conclusion that funding is basically an overarching issue for a lot of these issues. Um, and we were discussing a lot of questions on how people who don't have access to funding can get funding. And you know, how are ways that this convergence can make that happen? Can we fundraise? Can we create grants like can we think outside the box um because at the end of the day funding really um cassie was pointing out is like the supplier of technology the supplier of access to farmland you know this it's just basically everything you need to have a sustainable and healthy system going nice all right moving on don't be shy folks get your names in the chat here we want to hear. We want to hear from all the breakout rooms. I see Miranda is um, interested in that uh, dam removal piece that was mentioned there. Hi, Miranda. Hi, everyone. My name's Miranda. I was um, in a breakout room that Carl was leading, and we decided as a group um, that we would champion a priority around dam removal uh, because we felt it could impact the various sectors of the food system, um, since tangibly they. The, the projects restore waterways and the riparian lands and um, the resiliency, the ecological resiliency of, of those areas, the fisheries, the water quality and the floodplains. And, you know, all of this does inherently address inequalities within water access and fisheries access and tribal sovereignty. Um, and just we further recognize that, you know, dams were built by, by colonizers and they undoubtedly were the cause of native fish population declines, including sea run Atlantic salmon and other sea run fish species. Um, and they caused, they were part of the cause and degradation of our water quality and in our floodplains. Um, so ultimately by removing them, we would um, address these issues and um, you know, increase our ability to be resilient to climate change. Mm. That's beautiful. Um, one thing that nobody ever thinks about with the dam removals and the, and the fish runs up the rivers is that that was a great source of fertility for the forests. You know, those giant salmon runs because the salmon would go up there and, and die and that fertility would be, just be spread. Well, well, that's, that, well, just, you're right that they have, they do contribute fertility wise, but Atlantic salmon actually, which are the species in Maine, um, unlike Pacific salmon, do not perish when they when they uh -huh. spawn, they, they can actually come back again and again. Unfortunately, we don't see that very often anymore. Um, but other species do, like lamprey, um, they do. The, those species of sea run fish do um, die after they um, do spawn. And then ultimately, there's even if they don't die, they're still bringing in sure. uh, countless nutrients from the ocean to our headwaters and to our forests along the riparian area. So there is still that transfer of nutrients. but. Right, with all the predators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. I see um, Talia from my room is, um, she has some, had some great ideas. You want to share those, Talia? Sure. Um, so our group talked about all of the priorities, but um, I highlighted number six as well as a lot of our um, group members did, um, where I feel that, you know, that's probably one of our most important um, priorities since uh, we've had this history of uh, hurting um, other people and hurting the land 
and um, not really focusing on healing. And so if we start to bolster trust with, you know, um, the First Nations and Indigenous people who we've hurt, um, then we can start to build more of a community and build more of a trust and network system um, that can ripple out to all of these different priorities as, you know, as everyone starts to care about each other more and more and starts to um, want to help their neighbors, um, love the people around them. Uh, that goes into, you know, um, supporting all of the farming and fishing and supporting labor rights and, um, and also through education, since you're learning about the people around you, um, as well as um, putting less of a focus on the industrial agricultural um, side and uh, less imports of food and more uh, local practices, as well as we talked about how um, some of these words like rewiling and, um, uh, and kind of ideas that don't go into agroecology are problematic and we looked into more stewarding the land and um, trying to have everyone feel uh, comfortable in where they're living and um, loving the people around them. Nice. I see. Thank you so much, Talia. I see Jamie Pacheco is um, interested in state policy supporting food businesses. Um. Hello. Uh, I'm speaking for our group, um, and we we kind of instead of focusing on one specific priority for this end conversation, we kind of talked about we talked about a strategy that could that would impact these priorities. So we settled on you know the idea that if our state government had more support for our regenerative agriculture or local food systems, um, raising up main food systems sorry main food producers then that would lead to you know hitting priorities under number two and three and four and five and seven and eight um but we did acknowledge that there can be difficulties in this uh because it, government support can um can take away from say nonprofit efforts or other groups so there's definitely a balancing act in this um and the the other i think large reason that a large reasons we're supportive of this is because by supporting main businesses and main food businesses that though those our, our economy can grow and there's a larger tax base um within the state and um i've lost my train of thought <laughs> so i'm going to end it there since i've lost my train of thought <laughs> well thanks jamie it was a good train while it was running thank you um I see Shannon Brenner, um, unless someone else from your group is stepping up, you wanna share share out? Um, yeah, if, if someone from my group wants to add anything, but um, I think that uh, we talked a lot about technical as assistance, um, specifically related to um, funding for, um, for, for funding and research for things that would support climate resiliency and adaptation. I think maybe it was Julia that seemed like her group was kind of on a similar trend of, of thinking about how can we um, provide um, assistance and help with funding and help with research for, for um, some of these climate related issues. We talked about um, drought concerns about water um, as well as concerns with fisheries and also briefly touched on um, looking at funding of like NRCS and funding of, of um, technical assistance like agencies and, and how the underfunding of those agencies has affected like the, their relationships in the communities with farmers and their ability to um, support farmers in the, in the community um, and providing assistance um, to make sure that farmers have access to the programs that are being offered through these different offices. Um, so I think that's a, a, the fair, a fair summary of like the priorities and kind of how we discuss them. Nice. I see Eric Day is stepping up. Eric, what did you guys talk about? Sure, can you guys hear me? <clears throat> yeah. Yep. Great. Uh, so our group didn't necessarily come to any consensus on what we thought were the top priorities, but what dominated the conversation uh, was around uh, one 
five and six. So farmland and farmland access, technical assistance, and sort of this uh, sort of trying to bridge the gap between um, decolonization or or the sorry the current model and and uh, sort of sharing of the commons. And so I think, and someone in my group can correct me if I'm wrong, but I sort of walked away with sort of leveraging technical assistance to provide uh, support and investments towards models that bridge that gap and bring the current economic model closer to uh, a more sharing of common land uh, model. And then therefore would provide that land access and, and ability to grow as a com community or um, with, with sort of common purpose, I guess is how I understood it. Nice. So kind of combining a couple of things there, a couple of the priorities. I'll go real quick for my group, Scott. Okay. <laughs> um, two major things stuck with me, at least from our group. One is certainly um, the sixth one here, the building bridges one. And just to like sum that up is uh, there's a quote somewhere around, I think we read it Monday that like when everything, you know, goes to shit, like we have each other and that's what we're going to have. Um, and so that's like foundational. Um, so building those, those relationships. And then um, I think it would maybe fall in number three, the carbon farming and regenerative practices. We touched base a little bit. There's like some excitement around um, nutrient cycling uh, from like an institutional and farm level down to household level and like have it coming from state mandates and state support to be able to do that because so much food is put in the landfill and people are hungry and there's like a main ran out of compost, I believe this past year um, and the soils are like quite depleted. So that, and it would also create jobs um, for picking up the compost, processing, selling the compost, you know, um, so, it, and then it's also just like the how, right? So to create it equitably, like the people who are working in this industry to make sure it's, there's some equity rolled in there. Um, and there was a lot of other conversation, but those are the two that really stuck with me the most. Cool. Well, we have a couple of minutes left and this to share out. Who, are there, there must be groups that haven't, um, haven't shared out at all yet, or is just there anybody that's got some strong, um, strong thoughts right now? Of, so we're gonna have, in a, in a little bit, we're gonna have some um, little uh, Google forms to fill out to kind of rank priorities based on your own, just you know, personally. And then we're gonna take that into consideration along with all the jam boards and see if we can, in the next few days, come up with three areas that in the next session we're gonna we're gonna um, divide up our teams and and part of this too is is really like we're trying to not necessarily pick the three priorities that would be the best things for Maine right now but we're trying to pick the best three priorities that this group feels passionate about and feels strong about and has some um, you know deep interest in so, you know, if this was a different group of people, we would obviously maybe, you know, come up with a different set of priorities. So anybody else want to share before we, um, before we move into the next, start wrapping this up? Yeah, we have one more minute. <laughs> well, I, uh, I told Chloe that I would support her in her, in her presentation. I just wanted to add that uh, funding the conversation of funding was a really big piece, um, as was the climate adaptability. Uh, we saw how many of the other uh, bullet points fit, could fit into a climate adaptability agenda. Um, uh, everything from you know decolonizing, decolonizing permaculture to, to labor, to carbon farming, to technical assistance. Um, Good point. Good way to wrap it up, Bill. All right, so let's um, let's um, let's do this. So we've got Annie. You're going to share out this these Google Forms. 
No? Uh, yeah, but I just want, quickly want to mention that um, the conversation does not have to stop, stop here. Um, we have a Slack channel that you can very easily, hopefully, not everybody, <laughs> sign up for. Um, so I just put it in the chat. So, you know, don't let the conversation stop here. Don't, don't let the relationship building stop here. Um, this is one way to continue. So, and we'll also have all of your just contact information, just emails, I believe, in your participant packet. So you can find people um, in your participant packet soon. And I'll email folks when that's up. Um, <laughs> Carl. And then, um, oh, right, I skipped a thing. Ready to go. Priority. Oh, sorry, I did skip that. Um, yeah, and now, and actually, I'll put it in the chat, um, Sandy, so you don't have to do that. I just put in the, um, wait a minute, that wasn't it. Yeah, that was Is it. it. Oh. That was it. Uh, I just put in the, it says track priorities, but that's confusing. That's wrong. I just put in the chat a Google form um, that you can go into and weigh in on your top priorities. There's, we ask you to weigh in on four. We're only going to ch choose three, but doing four gives us a little bit more information. Um, so if you could go in there right now um, and in the next five minutes, put your thinking caps on and just go with your gut a little bit, <laughs> your gut and your brain, and decide on, on what you think, um, you know, main needs, what there's momentum for in this group, or what there's momentum for in general, um, what people can get excited about, um, and that is going to help direct where we go with track B um, from here on out. And like Scott said too, it's very probable, especially with the track B feel, that some of these will merge anyway. Um, so just give us your input. We want to hear directly from you individually, and we'll process these uh, soon and get back to you uh, in an email about what priorities came came up on top. All right, Scott. Yeah, yep. so everybody, thanks for filling out the Google Forms there, and we'll be looking at those soon. Um, Heather, are you still out there? Just, yeah, I'm here. Just want to thank everybody so much for, for being here. Um, you want to add something, Heather? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just appreciate you all, you know, participating in this great work. I think it's the most important work we can be doing right now on behalf of our community and the great people that are providing food, uh, the fishermen and the food growers and the kids, the youth and the, and the planet. So I think it's, it's the greatest work we can all be a part of right now. And I appreciate you taking three hours of your life to be here with us today and hopefully over the next couple of weeks we can really take the time to have big dreams and big goals with big outcomes. Well, Alan. <laughs>